Welcome to the Armani Talk Show, episode 14, recording live from the sunny weathers of Tampa. It hasn't been too sunny as of late, though. Once this year started, I noticed a lot of bipolar weather. Sometimes it was the perfect weather, other times it was freezing, and other times it was raining a lot, and I began to think. The weather influences my mood a lot. A couple of years back, there was this one roommate that I had who would always keep the place really cold, where I would like to keep it semi-warm. I wouldn't even say warm, because I believe having it too warm in your living facility is just as bad as having it too cold. For me, my ideal temperature is roughly around the 71 to 73 mark in my crib. But this guy would go ahead and turn it down all the way to 65 and sometimes 62. There was this one day that I woke up and I was coughing nonstop. I check outside and it's freezing. In Florida, if it's one of those, um, let's say, 30 degree days, that's considered cold. So it's 30 somewhat degrees outside and this guy has it 60 somewhat degrees inside. And a mix of that minus the blanket on my end led to me being cold. I was just coughing the entire day. And then I told my roommate, I'm like, dude, do you really need the AC that low? And he's like, yes. I was like, okay, I mean, are you willing to compromise on this? He's like, no. I was like, wait a minute, man. I mean, we're both paying rent. I don't know who said that you have the final say in something like this. This is a big issue. It's not one of those things where it's like a minor quirk. This is something that's beginning to stack up. And this guy is over here talking about his beard. Because when you have a big beard like he did, apparently you get hotter way quicker. So he's like, so Armani, you wouldn't know about that. Like when you have a big beard like me, you're going to just need the AC on more. And in addition to that, this guy was one of those like bulky physique kind of guys. He wasn't lean. He wasn't fat. He was just bulky. And he also said, due to my bulk, I tend to get hotter quicker. I'm like, man, bro, this is so freaking annoying. Other than that, I would say he was a semi-good roommate. I mean, he also was a little dirty at times, which would get under my skin. But other than that, I mean, we had very similar personalities. We were around the same age. We were pursuing similar goals in life. And I just knew him. You know, there was rapport there. A lot of the times I'm hesitant to get a new roommate because I don't know what kind of personality this guy's going to be. What if he's a weirdo? So I knew this guy. Once the lease ends, he's like, all right, Armani, are we going to renew or are we going to find a new place to live in? About that, bud. This year I'm going solo. And he's like, wait, what? I thought we were doing well and everything. And I was like, yeah, we are, bro. But the thing is, I'm going solo. I didn't give much more information than that because I didn't want this to be a negotiating moment. But I realized that certain times, one person is going to have something that they are adamant about and the other person is equally as adamant on it. For me, the weather, whether it's outside or inside, is something that is very big for me. When this year started, there were some days where it was like so freaking cold. And every morning, I go for this walk, right? When it was that cold, there were way more thoughts in my mind of "Mm, postpone the walk or don't walk outside. Go to a gym and walk on the treadmill. But I noticed when I walk on the treadmill versus walking outside, I don't feel as alert for the day. Because when I walk outside, I am forcefully getting sun. And when I get sun, I feel good. So there's these little ripple effects that are occurring because it's so freaking cold. And for me, that's a very big thing. To this day, I don't know why anyone in their right mind would live up north. It's more expensive. It's freaking freezing. And it's just too packed. I'm a southern boy. That's why I like Tampa. Because for the most part, even though I'm complaining about the weather right now, overall, it's pretty good. I mean, nowadays, it's back to being like 76 degrees. That's amazing. I mean, more realtors actually need to talk like that whenever uh, people from out of town are trying to invest 
in down south properties, they really need to hype up the weather because even people up north, they're like, bro, up north is where my family is. But something about the weather, man, is just so freaking annoying. I just can't deal with it anymore. But they have to deal with it. And due to having to deal with it, they just don't like it like that. So that was one of the things with the roommate that annoyed me. Another thing that annoyed me about this particular roommate was something that seems very small to people I've noticed, but it's very big to me. I believe as soon as you are done eating, you should wash your plate. Okay, no questions asked, just wash the plate. But this guy had a different philosophy. He's like, well, let me just leave the plate uh, in the sink. Which a lot of people do, by the way. Whenever some people are like, oh, well, I have dish duty for the week. I think, well, what do you mean by dish duty? Like, that's on your chores list? Like, yes. And basically what happens is that throughout the week, a lot of these family members are just getting their dirty plates, putting it in the sink, and not doing anything with it. Where me, it's muscle memory to wash my plate and put it back. Okay, so whenever someone is not doing that, it bugs me a lot because let's say me and this roommate, we just ate some pasta on glass plates. Once we're done, I'm going to wash it immediately and put it back where he's just going to put it in the sink and then come back to watching TV. I'm going to be like, oh, man, I can't even focus on the show because I just am picturing that wet pasta sauce drying potential bugs infiltrating my place. And this guy's lackadaisical approach to just leaving the plate in the sink. Bro, why couldn't you finish the job? It's like me just tying your left shoe uh, lace, but not your right shoe lace. It's like, dude, can't you just do both? Can't you just do the dishes when you're done eating it? When it's the best time to do the dishes? When the food is still somewhat soggy, so it just comes right on off? Why don't you just do that, man? And I've been talking to different people about that. I thought my strategy was the norm. Boy, was I wrong. It is not remotely the norm. The norm is what my roommate did, where you um, get whatever dish, eat it, and then put it in the sink. And later on, you'll get to it when you get to it. My strategy, for the most part, is something people are like, you immediately do it? I'm like, yeah, you don't? Like, nah. And in addition to that, whenever I go to, let's say, a get-together and uncles and aunties are hosting it, my muscle memory is so strong that if I ate on a glass plate, your boy is going to want to do the dishes even though I am a guest. That's when the uncles and aunties are like, no, 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 Arman, just leave that in the sink. I'm like, look, lady, dude, you don't want me to leave this in the sink because, you know, I'm a little weird with that. They're like, Armand, I said leave it in the sink. And they just grab the plate from my hand and they put it in the sink. I'm like, oh, man, I'm feeling such strong bodily sensations in regards to this. I've been doing this trick as of late where I went on Amazon recently and I bought these actual Chipotle bowls. You know the bowls that you get from Chipotle? Um, you could actually just order the bowls alone in Amazon. It's square, not circular like the typical Chipotle ones. Close enough. And I get like plastic utensils and forks. Now, I don't mind doing dishes for the most part. uh, But but what I've noticed is that I've been experimenting with one pot meals a lot. I only eat one time in the day. So I want that one meal to be super convenient where I know that, okay, this is something I can see myself doing long term. So what I'll do is I'll make that one pot meal. And I kid you not, once I put it in one of the Chipotle bowls, it kind of activates two different modes. It activates the cooking mode where I feel proud for cooking myself a dish. But it also feels like I'm getting fast food. Where I don't know if you'll be able to relate to this or not. But some people like they know that cooking is good for them. But something about ordering fast food, being given that package, feels good to them. When they get that McDonald's um, order and they're giving it in that McDonald's bag, it feels good. When they get that Chipotle bowl, it feels good. When they get Taco Bell, it feels good. They really like that unit of measurement that these fast food restaurants use when packaging their order. And I noticed that ever since I've been getting 
home cooked meals, and I've been kind of packaging it in this fast food like way. I've just been more consistent with my diet. Where at the end of the day, when my willpower is fried, I'm like, mm, I don't necessarily know if I want to go to fast food. I actually want to cook. You guys should actually experiment with this, where it's like these one pot meals. I've been making beefaroni, and I've been getting all my macronutrients as well. I get a good amount of protein. Um, I get a good amount of carbs, healthy fats, uh, all of that stuff. And you just stick it all in the pot, let it simmer. And once it's done, it's done. And it's such a great feeling. How important is learning to cook nowadays? Is it still an important thing? A while back, I talked about the concept known as cable cutting, where a lot of millennials are like, why are we paying the cable companies all of this money again? We don't even watch cable like that. So what they do is they cut the cable and then they just leverage streaming platforms. Well, my remix to that is that there are a lot of folks nowadays who don't cook at all anymore. They only eat once or twice a day. So they're like, why don't we just do fast food? You don't have to clean up after yourself. You don't have to uh, heat up the food, cut onions, all of that. Just do it yourself. So more and more people are what I call cooking cutting. They're cutting ties with cooking, and nowadays they're going somewhere to get their food made for them. Is it still necessary to learn how to cook? I think the answer is yes. I believe knowing how to cook is good uh, versus like not having a clue. Because when you're first learning to cook, you think it's so easy. You watch one of these Tip Hero Tasty videos, and you're like, oh, look at these guys. They're just putting step by step by step. And a lot of the times, your dish will come out right. But other times, you'll notice yourself missing one step, and the whole dish is ruined. So you got to factor in the entire experimentation phase, especially when you're learning to cook. So that's something that you don't just pick up later on, where a lot of people that are like, I never learned how to cook, but yeah, I'll just learn it later on. It's kind of like saying, well, I've been like a hoe my entire life, but when I find the right guy, I'm just going to randomly become a housewife. It's like, there's certain skill sets that are required to be a housewife. You don't just drop bad habits and become uh, like a different person out of nowhere. And likewise, it's the same thing with uh, cooking. You don't just drop like the bad habits of And by the way, I wouldn't really argue that it's a bad habit. I think a lot of places outdoors, you can eat and it can give you the essential stuff that you need for the day. But let's just, for the sake of the argument, say eating out has a lot of bad habits. You can't just randomly be like, okay, I'm ready to learn how to cook without saying, I got to put in an effort. Now, the question is, why the heck are you going to put in an effort? I believe different people are going to feel this at different moments, but I've at least been feeling this, where every now and then I just get tired of just waiting in lines, uh, being skimped on portion sizes, and just dealing with poor customer service. Where I'm like, you know what? I I have more control over my um, my dish when I know how to cook. Where when I'm not cooking, I'm giving control to someone else. And depending on how important food is for you, where food is pretty important for me, I don't really consume much stuff throughout the day. So food is one of the things I do consume. So I want that one meal to be really good. So if I keep going to spots and I'm like, man, they just messed up my order. Man, they barely gave me any meat. Uh, Eventually, I want to take matters into my own hands. And that's when I want to come back to cooking. But if you've never cooked, then you're not coming back to anything. You're learning cooking. And there's that large experimentation phase that you need before you start to understand the little tools of the trade. Like I've made chicken curry so many times and recently I just learned you should put onions in your dish because onions release this certain acid that tenderizes the meat. So some people that cook their curry without any onions, their meat is a little bit more chewier and harder. While if you put the onions in there, it just falls off. It's so freaking tender. It's amazing. That's not something I would have known in the beginning stages. That's something that I needed to experiment on. And eventually, I figured it out. So that's one reason to learn to cook because one day you are going to need to learn it and you don't want to be caught with your pants down. You want to have gone through a lot of the experimentation phases so you're not wasting a lot of your dishes. Because like I said, if you miss one key ingredient or you get it wrong, the entire dish is ruined. 
and imagine how much money you spent on that one dish. And I'll give you some numbers. So I've been making this beefaroni thing recently, right? So I've been experimenting with different types of pasta because some pastas have a lot of protein, while other pastas have little protein. The pastas that have a lot of protein, um, you know, some of them are made from lentils and chickpeas. This is a new concept to me. So I tried it out. Yesterday, I spent roughly $10 for the lentils pasta, the ground beef, and a can of crushed tomatoes. And um, I already had cheese. So all of that factored in comes out to 10 bucks. I do the whole one pot style. And then what happens is that the lentil pasta, it just tastes nasty to me. I mean, maybe I undercooked it. I went on Reddit and someone said that it requires a way longer cooking time than other types of pastas. But at a certain point, I'm like, man, this is just getting annoying. And I had to just dump the entire dish out because each time I was biting into it, I'm like, no, nah, it doesn't taste right. It tastes kind of bad. So pretty much $10 just went down the drain. Now, in the future, I know that lentil pasta may be right for other people, but it's not necessarily right for me. But that data point has been registered. So in the future, let's say I have kids and they need a meal made. I can now reference that data point into the future. So you don't want to be caught with your pants down later on when you do want to learn how to cook because there is a learning phase. I would say another case for cooking is that it's kind of fun. If you um, aren't cooking too much in the day and you have a good process for cleaning up after, that's the thing I love about the one pot meals where you don't really have to clean that much. You're just um, uh, getting a bunch of sauce out of a can, getting a bunch of pasta out of a box uh, and getting uh, some ground beef and putting it on there. So you're throwing away a lot of the containers. You're not really cleaning up after yourself in that regards. The main thing that you're cleaning up is the spoon that you're stirring with and the pot. And that's something that you could easily create processes for. So that's something that uh, uh, if you have the right processes for cleaning, um, then I think cooking becomes fun. Because if you ask most people, like, do you really like to cook? They'll say, yes, I actually do like to cook, but I hate to clean. And you could say, like, like dishwashers, like, well, what about dishwashers? I don't really know um, much about dishwashers. Like, I don't really cuff, come from an upbringing where I ever used a dishwasher. So I'm very ignorant on that field. But cooking in itself is pretty fun. So I, I do see a case being made for that more. I slowly see more and more people learning to cook. Where nowadays, there's this movement of dumb phones. Did you notice that? A lot of people are trading in their smartphone for one of those old school Nokia dumb phones. And I'm like, why? They're like, dude, I'm on my phone way too much. I am taking extreme measures. And something about having this dumb phone allows me to connect to the essence of what the phone was supposed to be about, which is communicating with someone. Where in the smartphone, I'm more antisocial than ever. I'm over here on TikTok, playing games, always just to myself, ignoring a lot of these messages. Where on the dumb phone, since I don't really have anything else to do on it, I am more prompt in calling someone back and texting someone. So these dumb phones allow people to connect. So just like a lot of people are reverting back from smartphones to dumb phones, I see a lot of people going from eating out a lot to learning how to cook and then refining their process along the way. These businesses nowadays, they've been making this very slick move as of late. Others are not noticing, but your boy is noticing because here's what happened. A couple of weeks ago, I went to this new coffee bar and I'm with someone and this person orders a small coffee where I ordered a large coffee and the barista was like, okay, so you want an El Bruno, right, sir? I was like, whatever, like a large iced coffee. She's like, yes, yes, an El Bruno. So she writes it down. She, uh, you know, to calculates our total. It comes out to like 20 somewhat bucks. Then she's like, go ahead, sit down. Someone will bring the coffees to you guys. Mind you, the person that I went with ordered a small coffee. I ordered a large coffee. By the time we sit down and the person uh, delivers the items to us, I notice that both the coffees are the same exact size. I let the lady know, um, excuse me, ma'am, I ordered a large coffee. Uh, this person ordered a small coffee. And the lady looks at me. She's like, yes, yes, you ordered an El Bruno, right? 
I'm like, yeah, yeah, I mean, like an iced coffee, large. She's like, yes, yes, an El Bruno, here it is. I'm like, well, where's the rest of it? She's like, no, no, this is the what an El Bruno is. I'm like, but did you hear this? It's supposed to be a large iced coffee. This person got a small iced coffee. We have the same exact size. I mean, what's up with that? It's like, sir, uh, this is an El Bruno. I, I don't know what else to tell you. And me, as a consumer, I'm being introduced to this new language out of the blue moon. I'm not really trying to have a standoff with this lady right now. She's doing her job. I get it. So I'm just kind of like, okay, fine. Just give me this El Bruno. I drink it. And afterwards, I had this very angry feeling. Not towards anyone, but the concept that's occurring as of late. The sneaky trick that a lot of these businesses are pulling nowadays is that they are stripping away the portion sizes, they're increasing the prices, and they are introducing fancy names to divert your attention. Like, I asked for a large iced coffee, lady, but what they're doing is they're making it smaller and smaller and smaller. They're raising the prices, and then they're like, okay, let's just put a fancy name on it so these guys think that they're paying for some sort of art. I'm not trying to pay for no art. I am just trying to get what I ordered money for, and I see more people trying to do something like this. I think fancy restaurants and fancy establishments are some of the biggest scams out there. But I believe that more and more of these um, restaurants have to tilt towards that way. So this is one of those situations where I understand why business owners are doing it, but as a consumer, I hate it. The reason that a lot of business owners are doing it is because they're learning. The worst type of business to be in is in the restaurant business. It's awful because a bunch of things can go wrong and a bunch of things will go wrong. Number one, you're always dealing with like these different food suppliers who can raise the price on you out of nowhere. Number two, you have to effectively uh, do projections for what units you're going to get so you can stick it in your warehouse so the food doesn't go bad and you wasted a lot of money. Three is you got to pay uh, like for service workers. Four, you got to deal with mean reviews that could obliterate your business overnight. It's just a bunch of different stuff that sucks. And that's why a lot of these restaurant owners fail in the beginning. And in addition to that, they can't really pay their employees because the restaurant owners are making low margins themselves. That's why they introduced the concept known as tips, right? Tips are a way to really put the onus on the consumer for the restaurant owners having, no offense, having chosen a failing business model, which I get. Like, if you need consumers to pay tips so you guys can consistently make food and serve it to the public, I'm for that, all right? I'm not against that. But what's happening is that nowadays, like, there's a lot of consumers. They're like, they're learning to cook. They're not eating out as much. And they're not tipping as much. So these places, nowadays, they have a problem. They're like, our margins are low enough uh, as it is. I mean, we can't go any lower. Um, What are we going to do? And then they're like, okay, well, let's raise the prices. And they can't just raise the prices out of the blue moon. They need a certain um, uh, brand for that. And that's why these high-ticket Restaurants are now coming up because now they could always have the cop out like, sir, we're not a Dunkin' Donuts. We're a place that serves El Bruno, right? Uh, like they have this artistic uh, vibe to them. And nowadays when consumers come, they're being sold a narrative. It's pretty much the same ingredients, by the way, but they're being sold a narrative that's like, yes, I mean, uh, this place has El Bruno. And the other person that they're with is like, what's an El Bruno? And now this person feels like an artist themselves because they're indulging in this expensive food that's virtually the same as something that is not as expensive. And now they're explaining it to their buddy, like, oh, let me explain to you what an El Bruno is. One of the biggest scams out there. And it doesn't matter how much money I make, these type of scams never appeal to me, right? Like, I have no reason to go to one of these fancy restaurants Pay a hundred bucks for these uh, this tiny meal where after I eat it, now I gotta uh, go home and cook myself the real meal. Like I have no desire for that at all. You see, where some people like they really desire that, like they really want to go to Salt Bay's restaurant and drop a couple of grand. I get it for the experience, but overall, like going there consistently has never been my thing, and I don't 
quite understand how anyone uh, can be sold on these types of lies. So this is one thing that I've been noticing as of late. A lot of these places are introducing these different works of art. What do you consider art nowadays, by the way? I was having this episode on the Unapologetic Truths podcast, which you should check out. It's a show that I co-host with Life Math Money, aka Harsh Strongman. And we talk about different concepts uh, within life, okay? And one day we were talking about what is art nowadays? And my buddy was talking about how, you know, art doesn't necessarily appeal to him as much because it's not high ROI. Where back in the days, if you like, let's say, drew someone or you did a sculpture of someone, that was seen as a boss thing to do. It's like, wow, that's such a difficult thing to do, especially because technology did not exist. Nowadays, though, um, with technology, it's so freaking easy to recreate these images. And I thought he had a point. In the future, once the 3D printer begins to stack up in its complexity, what's going to happen is that you just give it a block and it's going to do subtraction technology and chisel away to give you a very identical thing that Michelangelo himself built. So nowadays, if a human being can like you know sculpt away, a lot of people are like, why would you do that? I mean, why don't you just um, get a 3D printer to do it? So that element of art is being stripped away as more and more technology is being introduced. So I asked my buddy, like, what do you view as the modern day form of art? And he gave a very compelling answer. He said that anything that deals with um, AI or coding. And I thought, yeah, I mean, that's something that's very difficult to automate because that is what leads to the automation in the first place. So interesting. Yeah, I, I've always viewed these guys as engineers, but in some ways, I guess they are modern day artists as well. My response was something different. I believe the modern day artists are people who can communicate very well. Because when you can communicate very well, that's something, even if technology can do, we don't really connect with it. And I'll give you an example. Recently, uh, there's been a lot of these TikToks that have been appealing to me. These TikToks are of these 32-year-old women who have just come back from a bad date, and they're explaining it. There's a thing called story time. They're explaining the bad date. And they go on a series of these bad dates, right? And they're just explaining these different scenarios. And it's so freaking addicting to watch. Like these um, girls, they're just really relatable people, right? They just seem like average people. And they're great communicators. They have real life experiences that I'm just like, huh, really interesting. And I found myself just watching a bunch of these videos at once. Now, imagine if a computer or any form of technology is trying to tell me a similar story time video. I'm not going to be able to connect with that because with the girl, like, I, I kind of like laugh when she's just like, oh, yeah, my a date well, like went in for a kiss so quick. I'm like, oh, OK, that's that seems like something realistic that will happen to you. Um, my date wanted to go 50 50. I was like, ah, that's also funny because like, a lot of people go 50 50 nowadays. My date uh, asked me what when I wanted to get married on the first date. I'm like, oh, wow, like all this stuff, it's grounded in human experience. So something fun to connect with. Where if a computer is doing it, and it doesn't matter, like the computer can give me the most breathtaking poetry out there. But ultimately, I know that it's not grounded in human experience. So it just feels fake to me. Where with these girls on TikTok that are doing the story times, I'm like, this is art. Now, most people will be like, man, these are just a bunch of girls complaining. What are you talking about? I'm like, no, 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 man. I perceive it as art. But the fundamental point is that communication skills that are grounded in real human experience, that is the modern day art. Or before, people were being silent. Like a lot of these artists were being silent as they were chiseling away, as they were painting away. But modern day art is the exact opposite of you being silent. It is you speaking. It is you expressing yourself. And that's why in the future, I think a lot of the stuff that I cover with the Armani Talks brand, it's going to see like this surge in popularity where people want to learn concepts such as impromptu speaking more. People want to know like, I have so many thoughts throughout the day. How can I choose a topic that I assign to myself? No one else assigns to me. I assign this topic to myself and then I'm able to scope through the fluff versus the real thoughts to deliver a compelling talk. That is impromptu speaking 101. No 
preparation needed at all. People are going to be more curious about that. People are going to be more curious about just starting a podcast. I mean, I was just noticing recently, like a lot of these retired athletes are starting podcasts nowadays. Shaquille O'Neal, Carmelo Anthony, Dwayne Wade. I believe within this year, they all started a podcast. And more and more people are going to start podcasts. I mean, look at Shaquille O'Neal. If you think about it, he doesn't really need to start a podcast. He already is on that uh, one show with Charles Barkley, Kenny Smith. Um, so why is he starting a podcast for? It's because something about podcasting is so freaking fun. It's fun because it feels like you're giving all of yourself, right? Um, I actually heard Logan Paul break this down one time. So Logan Paul has a bunch of different mediums that he participates in, right? He gets, um, he has WWE, he used to vlog a lot, he has a show called Impulsive, and a lot more different ventures. One day, he said that where you are going to find the realest version of Logan Paul is on Impulsive. And you'll just see how different his mannerisms are on that show versus when he's vlogging. When he's vlogging, you could tell he's putting on this character, this facade. And obviously, it's understandable. He's trying to entertain a large-scale audience. But with Impulsive, it's just him being himself. He's just having a conversation. And the audience gets to understand what he really feels in regards to certain issues. You see? So that's what makes podcasting so fun. Because it's us introspecting out loud. Now, if you have a co-host, the co-host can amplify that introspecting process where the co-host will often ask the main host hey um well what do you think about this why 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 they keep pressing the host until the host has this aha moment and the host if he's smart enough he's going to press the co-host and they're basically just introspecting out loud with one another that is what makes podcasts so fun and that is why more and more people nowadays are starting podcasts. I recall um, when, you know, I was an undergrad, I graduated, um, I went to my master's, there were like two guys that would always talk sports. And eventually they went to get married, uh, they had kids, and they decided to start a podcast together. No one listens to it, by the way. But every Sunday, they uh, have this sports podcast where they just talk about the recent events. I was listening to an episode recently, and I was just cracking up because it's just two guys having a good time, having a conversation. You could tell they don't remotely care about the views at all. It's just them having fun. They have real like nine to five jobs as well. So the podcast, like they're not emphasizing on monetizing it. So I'm just seeing art, you see? So even though I know these guys, every now and then I will listen to a little bit of their podcasts and I'm like, hmm, a lot of these guys that don't even want to um, podcast full time for a living, they're even starting podcasts. It's just a fun thing to do. I think like more couples, well, I wouldn't actually say the couples. I feel like that may cause a lot of arguments. Um, more friends should start podcasts together. Couples, what couples should think about doing is starting a um, YouTube channel together. Because think about it like this. There's so many of these couples that are always traveling um, somewhere new, right? And, you know, they're taking pictures and stuff. And they're, what do you call it? Like taking videos in their phone. But what happens is eventually they get a new phone. So they kind of have to start all over. And their entire life is too scattered. My thing is, why don't you buy one of these? This is called a GoPro. And you just um, get one of those kits that allow the GoPro to be on you. And you just walk around with it. Then what happens once you're done with the trip is that you have raw footage. And then one of you guys could edit the content or you could just give it to someone from Fiverr, get an editor, and you just get a final output of your content. Let's say it's like an eight minute video of your honeymoon. Now you guys upload this on a private YouTube channel where you guys can access this YouTube channel from any part of the world. Even if you get a new phone, it doesn't matter. You can still access the YouTube channel. A lot of people to this day do not know that you can make your YouTube channel private. Your boy, Armani Talks, I have over 1,300 videos published. But guess how many videos I don't have published that are on private right now? A lot. All right? It's literally just a drag and drop. 
but you don't even have to make it uh, uh what do you call it private as a couple you can make it public because and i went to this place called um oak mogi mounds a couple of weeks ago and i had no clue like if i should go i was just like oh man should i go like it's gonna be a big drive once i go there like should i go so I go on YouTube, and thankfully, there was this couple that recorded their entire experience in Okmulgee, and I was watching it, and I was getting so much practical utility out of it, because now I knew exactly what to expect. Same with another place called Stone Mountain. So if you make these um, YouTube channels uh, public, even if you don't be, uh, plan to become a long-term content creator, what happens is that you are uh, giving a lot of people value, and you're recording a lot of memories. I mean. And I've talked about how important it is for men to take more photos because we have the stigma against taking photos. We view this as a very feminine thing to do. But I think when you take more photos, it allows you to live in life, right? It allows you to recall your life way better because your memory is just so good, you know? But a phone, it's crystal clear. The same thing could be said with taking more videos. I mean, you don't have to take videos all the time, but for these big trips where you're shelling out at least $3,500, I mean, why not take more videos? Huh, that's actually a good idea, right? Where what podcasts are for friendships to keep it maintained, videos could be for couples. You heard it here. I'll explore this idea more in the future. Um, but yeah, content creation, I think nowadays is the modern form of art. I, I do believe every now and then it gets hijacked and it gets a lot of bad publicity. The reason that it gets bad publicity is because in the growing stages of the internet, there was a lot of thing called shock entertainment. And this isn't something that only happened with uh, the internet. It happened with any form of medium, where if you look at the progression of the of movies, of film. Before film, like there was a thing called like just shock entertainment where different people were just pieing each other, right? Or someone steps on one of those like lawn mowing racks and it hits them right on the face. Um, that was what film used to be about. But what began to happen was that different people were exploring it more. They're like, wait a minute, we're not really utilizing film to its maximum abilities. So that's when they started to experiment more. Where before, um, the radio was king. So uh, um, if someone was having a radio show uh, and the camera uh, was just invented, their version of creating a radio program or a TV show was literally just having a camera recording the guy talking. Later on, they wanted to challenge themselves more. So they started to experiment with drama, with comedy, with mystery, and much more. And look at film nowadays. Film, like if you go pay for a movie ticket and you just get a bunch of people pieing each other and that's it, there's no architecture, there's no spine, there's no story, you're going to be pissed. You're just going to be like, you just give me a random bunch of clips. So this happened with film where there was a thing called shock entertainment. And it's the same thing that's happening with the internet uh, where in the beginning, a lot of people on the internet, they were just doing a lot of wacky things. They were just like, ah, right? Um, there was a lot of entropy in their movements. You could actually, like I was talking about Logan Paul earlier, you could look at Jake Paul, where a lot of his content in the beginning stages, it was just him like just yelling a lot and just jumping up and down. Or later on, I wouldn't ever say that Jake Paul created riveting content that made me think. Uh, but later on, he actually started to use his words more. He started to get more control over his body. And you could tell he put in his reps. He got a lot smarter because he found out what worked and what didn't work. So I think with content creation, more people need to be patient and give creators the time to grow. Because as I said, these creators are introspecting out loud. So they have to take more risks. And when they're taking risks, sometimes it's not going to work. Sometimes it's going to be a dud. But later on, once they start you know, getting in their groove. They're just like, oh man, this works, this doesn't work. I think we're going to see a renaissance of great content. You got to understand it like this. There was this one era where everyone was having a patent. If you didn't have a patent to your name, people kind of looked at you. They're like, wait, you don't have a single patent to your name? This was like the golden era of um, invention, right? Everyone was inventing something. They were creating where our era's version of that is some form of content creation. Now it is like when I look at someone, 
a lot of the times i don't even expect it like i've known this person for a long time and one day they're just like oh yeah man i have this one uh instagram page where i just um i just record myself fishing with like this camera i was like oh okay um then how long have you been doing this four years four years you've been doing this well how many followers do you have Twenty two thousand. wait a minute wait a minute you have twenty two thousand people uh, that are following you to watch you fish yes this leads people to my youtube channel where they could watch my long form content i'm like long form content of you fishing people really do stuff like that he's like yeah so he has a he has an instagram page for content creation along with youtube channels um and i think in the future that's going to be our version of the invention a lot of people rather than just asking what do you do they're going to be like well what do you create right um oh you, you have a podcast oh, let me subscribe to it real quick um oh wait you have a um what else do you have you have a tiktok oh, i have a tiktok i mean what do you post on there and the deep guys that very introspective smart guys are gonna be like mm. i talk about philosophy because when people think tiktok they just think of like you know a bunch of tiktok dancers acting dumb and a lot of people who are being smart with their content creation sometimes feel embarrassed because they feel as though others are going to judge them for using the platform incorrectly. But the other person asking the question is like, wait a minute, I love philosophy. Uh, can I follow your page? They follow the page and then boom, a connection is born. So different people are going to use content creation for different reasons. It's not all going to be about being silly and acting like a, a airhead, which it's always going to be there. Even nowadays, there are like film that is, uh, you know, and it's not really meant to make you think. But I think a content creator is really great when they're consistently able to make you think and they're capable of evolving your perspective. They don't need to change your perspective, but they evolve it. And you evolve someone's perspective when you help them understand your position or you help them question theirs. And... um. It doesn't only have to be those two. You could also say like you could help them deepen their resolve as well. There are so many different things you can do with content creation, but you really need to understand the tools of the trade. And there's a lot of different things that a person needs to learn in the beginning stages. They need to understand the technology side of things where you got to somewhat understand how to use a camera. You got to somewhat understand lighting, somewhat understand how to remove background noise from a microphone. And in addition to this, you got to also deliver the content. And in addition to this, you got to also think of the content. So there's a lot of different things. I think you are a superstar if you can um, create the content and you could deliver it as well. Where a lot of people can't do both. And that's why, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but some of the biggest leaders out there, they have a thing called speech writers. Think of some of the best speakers you could possibly imagine. Yes, Barack Obama did have a speechwriter. And to write a speech for someone, you need two things. You need to somewhat understand the topic that they are delivering a speech on, and you need to somewhat understand them. And when I say somewhat, that's not even good enough because somewhat makes you deliver a speech, but not a compelling speech that a leader wants from you. For you to deliver a compelling speech, you got to be just as passionate on this topic as this person is. And you need to really understand the mannerisms of this person. Where if I'm delivering a speech for Barack Obama, and let's say he's talking about a topic that I don't know anything about, it's going to be very difficult for me to uh, create points within the talk for him to be taken seriously. Because ultimately, he's the person delivering it. On the flip side, imagine that I know everything about the topic he's talking about, but I'm not capturing the essence of Barack Obama's personality. What is his personality? He's highly confident. He is more than bold enough to crack jokes, and he's very comfortable taking pauses. So if I'm over here writing a speech and I don't introduce any gaps for pauses, I'm just being super serious the entire time, am I capturing Barack Obama's essence, his personality? No. So you need to be able to do both things. You need to be able to know the topic and you got to know the person's personality. To really understand the public speaking industry, you just need to study the music industry. I mean, music, like music singers, uh, rappers, uh, R&B people, whatever, they're technically public speaking. I mean, what is touring really? They're just going in front of different audiences and they're speaking to 
people at scale, and you could just replace speaking with singing. So that's a parallel. Like both have some form of public speaking. Both have forms of ghostwriters, where musicians they have a thing called the songwriters. They're also known as ghostwriters in the public speaking industry. It's known as speech writers. There's a lot of speakers that can deliver compelling talks, but they don't know how to create the talks. They have no clue at all on how to get their loose thoughts and to structure it into a unified piece. And there's another layer where they don't even know how to think of what they're going to talk about. So there's really three layers、uh, for great, great communicators. They know what they're going to think about. They ch- they choose the topic, right? No topic is being assigned to them. They assign themselves the topic and then they speak upon it. Then they design the talk. Then they deliver the talk. Whenever someone can、uh, design a talk but not deliver a talk, they become great speech writers. And whenever someone、uh, can deliver a talk but can't write a talk, they become great、uh, just communicators. That's what I'm saying. Like, if you could do both, if you could actually create your own talks and deliver it with a beautiful tonality and great showmanship, then you are a star. Okay, and you'll be shocked how many people don't do this. You know, it makes me cringe whenever I hear like comedians say,、uh, "Yeah, my writers wrote this." I'm like, "Wait a minute, you got writers? I thought you were the writer. I thought that's the reason that I'm over here watching you in the first place." So when they're saying, "Well, I have writers," I'm like, "Oh man, bro, like this is really bothering me right now."、Um, you should not be having a writer. You should be thinking of different things to. Uh, talk about based on your unique life experiences. You should be experimenting, refining your talk. Then you should be delivering it with passion because you actually lived it. But when other writers that's helping you like do all this stuff, I'm like, come on, man. So you got to be a star. I, I think more people should shoot to be a star rather than be so timid. A lot of these speech writers, they're、uh, like. Like you look at them and you're like, oh, I see why you're a speechwriter. Like they have no star power at all. They don't take care of the way that they look. They look like they smell、uh, from the screen. They、um, look super shy. I'm like, dude, come on, bro. If you could create a talk like this, you should be able to deliver a talk. There was this one book that I one time read called、um, "The Idea Factory."、Um, It was a book about、uh, Bell Labs, and the book was very intriguing. Where they were talking about how、uh, Bell Labs or AT and T, something like that, was like the first ever idea factory. And the author breaks down like the different key players that took part in building this factory. I'm like, wow, what a compelling book! And then this guy had to present the ideas、um, about the book on a stage. And that's when he was so like monotoned. He was just like reading off the slides the entire time. He was just a very boring guy. I'm like, dude, I'm still being patient with you because I like the book that much. But you gotta actually spice it up just a little bit. I don't like pe- when people think, "Well, I'm just an author or I'm just a speaker." You should think I am a communicator. That makes you like this beast. That's why Jerry Seinfeld, like, he gets so much respect for、uh, from people because he knows how to think of his topics. He knows how to write, and he knows how to deliver. So if you're ever thinking like, well, he's overrated, blah, blah blah, you might think he's overrated, but try doing what he's done for five months. Like just constantly, just think of new things to talk about, and keep delivering it, and you'll see that there's different problems for each side. Thinking of new things to talk about, eventually, we feel like we're hitting the ceiling where we're like, we've talked about everything. I mean, how many different ways can I talk about a particular subject? And you just keep hitting that ceiling, and each time that you hit that ceiling, there's two options: you either back away and cower away, or you break through that ceiling, and now you have a new ceiling to tackle. So that's a problem. Like, you know, it's a problem that you have to like challenge yourself. It's a mental workout. People can't see it either. They think it's so easy. They're like, oh, thinking of topics. I mean, whatever. Like、uh, anyone could do that. But when you make them do it, they're just like, oh man, that's difficult. Creating、uh, a talk around that topic, the challenges with this is that you know sometimes you may ramble, or sometimes you may not have that much to say. Sure, you thought of the topic, but you're like, I cannot do a full act on something like this. So there's problems with that as well. Where now,、um, just getting these different loose thoughts and just structuring it into something that can appeal to someone else, 
that's a challenge in itself. And then the other part, delivering the talk, I mean, there's a stage fright associated with it. What if uh, people that you know watch you speak and they begin making fun of you? There's dread associated with that. There's um, like the physical component of it where um, maybe you run out of breath real quick. You can't speak for more than 10 minutes without um, needing a break, right? There's like a physical element. So combining all of that stuff, I believe is such a beautiful aspect into self-improvement. I believe that makes you a really whole person when you're capable of uh, communicating your ideas in a very appropriate way. Because ideas that lie in the mind, my friend, die in the mind. So you don't want to just be thinking these great thoughts all the time and then never be uh, being able to vocalize it. And then you're resenting the person who did vocalize it. Um, or you're you know, talking to a guy, you're like, man, if it were me that was doing it, I would have done X, Y, and Z, lay out the blueprint. The guy's like, well, why don't you just say it? Like, speak up, say it in the meeting. You're like, no, 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 no. So they're like, okay, well, I don't want this idea to just die. So they deliver it. And now you're over here like, oh, well, well, why did he steal my idea for? This guy actually did the noble thing in this scenario because he asked you, hey, can you deliver it? And you're like, no. He knows that this is a fascinating idea. So for the sake of the entire team, he's like, okay, I'm going to share this idea. He would be a little bit more honorable if he's like, oh, well, he thought of it. But that also brings in a boatload of other problems. Like he thought of it. Now others are like, well, why didn't he deliver it? And now everyone's just like looking at you like, you see? So there's problems when you don't know how to speak up. You always want to think about like how things are affecting um not always want to think about, but every now and then you want to factor in what it's like for your environment. Um, I actually wrote this piece on ArmaniTalks.com. Click blog and you'll see the piece, which is, is it appropriate to ever date a coworker? And I took a stance on this. I said, no, I don't think it's appropriate to date a coworker. I think it's fine to date a former coworker where if they leave the company, then you hit them up and you're like, yo, it was good. I always thought you were like a very interesting person. You want to go for some coffee or you leave the company and then you reach out to them. I think that's fine. But I think dating a coworker is very dangerous and you never know what can happen. But the people that want to date their coworker, what happens is that they're capable of fooling themselves with their logic. And by the way, I'm being sarcastic when I say their logic, because you can make a compelling case for it. You could say, well, of course, why shouldn't pe people date their coworkers more? Um, you are constantly surrounded by the person, so you guys have great quality time together. You can monitor if they're being um, hit on by other men or women or not. You can um, uh, deepen the relationship through work. You understand what they do for a living, and they're just listing out this laundry list of logic. I have one question to ask that will just put everything to shame. What if something goes wrong? Just think about that. What if something goes wrong? And a lot of things can go wrong. I mean, one thing that could go wrong is that uh, the relationship just ends and it ends in a bad way. And the other person begins bad mouthing you. They're like, oh, yeah, he's so cheap. Or, oh, yeah, he's so like bad in bed. Or, yeah, he's like a very abusive guy. Boom, reputation at work ruined. Um, because people don't really care about what you do. They care about what they think you did. So this person is just over here like just gossiping about you. And you'll be shocked how fast gossip gets around in the work atmosphere. So that's one problem. Another problem is that nowadays people kind of question your character. They're like, wait a minute, this guy mixes business with pleasure. Mm, is this a smart person to give a promotion to in the future? And the third thing is that a lot of people have affairs in the office area. Um, how many times do you hear like, oh man, my my wife or my husband uh, slept with a coworker or their boss, right? And other coworkers are noticing stuff like this and they feel very, very uncomfortable. Sure, they have like juicy gossip material, you could say, but they feel really uncomfortable where they're just like, mm, really wish you guys wouldn't do this. I mean, you actively cheating on uh, Ben. We've met your husband in one of those work socials before and now you're putting us in a weird position. You're making us question our philosophy. We don't like this. And in the future, let's say this person they have all the credentials to reach the next level. They just can't because a lot of whispers are going around right now. 
And nowadays, to reach the next level, they actually have to switch the company. So a lot of things can go wrong when you date your a coworker. Don't do it, my friend. I'm telling you, like it is not the smart thing to do. Date them if they leave the company or you leave the company. And even then, you don't know if they're going to say yes. Maybe they'll just say, well, no, no, I just see you as a coworker, Max. Even though you left, I still just view you as Max the coworker. So don't get your hopes up too much, right? Because you're, when you're constantly surrounded by someone, um, a lot of the times you can just organically build feelings for them, right? Because the average human sleeps eight hours a day, but the average human also works eight hours a day. So work is a large part of our life. And you don't want to do something silly that gets you shadow banned. And getting shadow banned at work happens. Because we often think that shadow banning only happens on social media. It most certainly does. In work, it's a way more like subtle thing. It's subtle in social media too, now that I think about it. Shadow banning in itself is very subtle where other people do not necessarily believe you. You're like, trust me, man, something's going on. They're like, And then... Instead of empathizing with you, they start giving you these suggestions. Well, did you try this? Did you try that? Like, look, I tried all of that. I'm telling you, I'm shadow banned. Now they're looking at you like you're crazy because they're not directly experiencing it. Uh, I'll just finish off with one final story. There was this guy named um, Mike or Matt or whatever, white guy, 45, let's just call him Mike, uh, in our last company. He was a star in the making right he was doing like all this stuff right all the different teams started to like him and he was going to get promoted he was going to become a managerial director these guys get paid a quarter million everything was looking good then what happened one day was that different people came forward and they said that this Mike guy was really racist to them behind the scenes he'd make crude comments like well I don't expect people from your country to understand something like that I'm surprised you even have education like this aren't your people x y and z he'd make a lot of comments like this and eventually the seniors got word of this and to promote a guy like Mike to their level would show very poor judgment on their end senior management's team from the public that works for the senior management so suddenly, Mike just disappeared. Like, I I didn't hear from him again. Like, where he was always, like, in these different meetings speaking up. Nowadays, he wasn't in these meetings. He still worked in the company, which stinks even more. Like, when you get fired, like, you're like, okay, well, I got fired. I know, right? Where with shadow banning, you don't know. There's always that uncertainty. There's always you thinking, well, maybe next year I'll get that promotion, right? And other people are like, We'll see. And that we'll see it just stings at the soul. It's just like, oh man, like, what does that mean? So you could absolutely get shadow banned at work. That's why I, my thing is don't even be friends with your coworkers, man. Uh, like, yeah, don't even be friends. I remember like one of my last companies, like all these guys that are like, yo, man, you want to go to the beach this Saturday? I'm like, no. They're like, well, what are you doing this Saturday? I have to like think of some sort of excuse or sometimes I'm just like, bro, I see you guys in the week. I don't want to see you guys in the weekends as well. And when like there's too many friendships and stuff, like they get too comfortable with you. They start like gossiping about you more where with work, it's best to keep that mystery in my opinion. Like when you clock out, that's when your personal life begins. You don't treat your personal life uh, and your work life as the same thing. Especially if you work a corporate job. I can see an argument being made if you are like a business owner. But if you work at a job, my friend, don't date your coworkers and don't be too buddy buddy with your coworkers because eventually this type of stuff comes to bite you in the butt. And in the long run, you end up getting shadow banned and you have no clue why it happened. So if you enjoyed today's talk, my friend, here are a couple of action items I want from you. Um, where are you listening to this from? Are you listening to this from a podcast? Well, if so, try to leave me a review whenever you can. If you're listening to this on Twitter, go ahead and uh, retweet or like whatever you do. You give a comment. If you're listening from YouTube, hit like, hit, hit subscribe, hit the bell notification. And um, if you're just listening and you're just like, ah, man, I don't want to do any of that, then just go on ArmaniTalks.com. On my website, ArmaniTalks.com, you will get a bunch of my blogs, my books, my YouTube videos, podcasts, newsletter, all centralized into one location where you can really connect with me, where these different social media platforms, uh, their algorithms favor different things at different times. So sometimes you may see me, sometimes you may not. 
If you resonate with me and you want to hear more from me, ArmaniTalks.com is a website to go to. And I appreciate you for joining me. I will catch you in the beginning of next month. And hopefully you enjoyed the episode and make this year count. Thank you very much for joining me and I'll catch you next time.